And with that, we'll now step into one of our standing panels that we have every year. It's a panel on um, easily the most fast moving area of drug discovery and drug development, um, still with immense challenges, but now also immense opportunities. And this year we add a, a wrinkle as we do in every panel, which is which is COVID-19 and the effects that the pandemic is having on oncology drug development. And it's a great pleasure to introduce our panel moderator, Raju Kukrilapati. Please, Raju. Andy, thank you very much. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be a part of uh, this annual uh, event, which is great. And the program has been going tremendously well. Uh, we have a great panel for our discussion today. And we have Alice Ryson from uh, Tectonic. And we have uh, Lori Glimcher. And uh, just as an aside, it turns out that uh, Lori's uh, son, uh, Jake uh, Archenclos, uh, was declared to be the winner of the Democratic primary for the fourth district of Massachusetts. And so, therefore, he's most likely going to become the uh, new congressman uh, from uh, Massachusetts. And, Lori, congratulations. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, Phil Larson from uh, Bayer, and uh, Rehan Gershi from Serono, and Tony Ho from CRISPR Therapeutics. And, uh, so uh, as uh, Andy pointed out at the beginning, there's an explosion in the knowledge uh, about uh, human disease, and uh, cancer has been leading uh, this knowledge explosion. And uh, so the last 15 years has seen a tremendous amount of change in the way that we've been able to treat the cancer patients and the outcomes for these cancer patients has changed tremendously. Uh, but as many people pointed out, uh, uh, the pandemic has uh, an effect on this. So we'll start the discussion and, and I would ask uh, uh, Lori to make a comment and Lori, how did COVID affect treatment of patients? And did the pandemic affect the overall survival outcomes for patients in treatment? Well, thanks. I'm delighted to be on this panel. Uh, thanks for inviting me to join. And thanks for the kind words about my son, Jake Auchincloss. Um, Dana-Farber has uh, certainly, as all hospitals have, seen the impact of the pandemic and cancer patients, of course, are more susceptible to developing COVID-19 uh, because they're immunosuppressed. But I will say that I've been just overwhelmed and inspired by the way that Dana-Farber and other cancer centers have stood up to uh, make our patients feel safe and welcome. Um, we certainly did the best we could to reduce the risk to patients coming in using a, a number of, of, of methods to do that, um, including trying to put patients who could be switched from intravenous uh, chemotherapy or infusions to oral medications without affecting the course of their cancer. But I, 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 I do think that as Ned Sharpless said, uh, who's the director of the NCI, that we are gonna see an increase in cancer mortality over the next year or so, because there was a 96% decrease in the number of screenings for colonoscopies, mammograms, pap smears. And so we clearly have seen a decrease in the number of new patients that come in who have been diagnosed with cancer. And that's obviously not good for cancer because if we can catch cancer when it's at stage one, we can pretty much cure it. But if it has already metastasized, then we have a more difficult journey ahead for those patients. Dana-Farber did not cease uh, their clinical trials for cancer. As we all know, cancer clinical trials were allowed to proceed. Some cancer centers were not able to do that, but Dana-Farber did continue uh, enrolling patients because you know, 20% of our patients that their best option is to be part of a clinical trial. So um, a tough time for all of us, but I think that cancer centers around the world have done their very best to provide a safe environment and to continue treating our cancer patients who need us. 
Laurie, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, so that actually leads to the, uh, the next question for all of the panel members. Uh, how is this uh, you know, COVID pandemic affecting uh, new development of new cancer drugs and uh, therapies? And is this, uh, first of all, is this have an impact on overall clinical trials? And uh, is it also having an effect on R&D? Is it going to uh, change the timing of uh, approval of drugs and the development of uh, new drugs that everybody is anticipating? So maybe we could start with uh, Phil. Yeah, thank you very much. And I would, would like to also express my gratitude for being part of the panel. Uh, I think uh, um, it's um, fair to say that throughout the world, um, clinical trials in oncology are recruiting at a slow pace uh, for the exact reasons Laura just mentioned. It's difficult to um, get the patients to show up at um, clinical centers. Um, uh, but it's also uh, pretty clear that the diagnosis of cancers are happening at a slow pace because our medical um, professionals are, you know, busy uh, treating patients with COVID-19 and for that reason have less attention to also, um, you know, tracking and, and discovering early cancers. But there are one area in particular, there is one area in particular where I, I see a lot of increased activity and that's in the field of um, so repurposing drugs uh, for um, uh, as antivirals and uh, actually quite a lot of the, um, the drugs acting on uh, metabolism, cell proliferation, cell division uh, are, uh, you know, drugs that come out of um, cancer screening programs, and some of them have shown uh, both based on digital and in silico tools, promising uh, uh, effects on viral uh, metabolism and viral replication. And I'm pretty sure that some of the new antivirals we'll see could uh, come out of uh, uh, repurposed uh, cancer screening uh, programs uh, and um, I, I think we'll we'll see that uh, there is um, a, a joint effort here that's unprecedented. Uh, many different companies come together in public-private partnerships and try to you know find fast-track opportunities uh, to really bring forward uh, new antivirals. Okay, Rehan. Yeah, uh, sure. Thanks, Roger. So, so maybe just to frame it, um, because we've looked pretty broadly um, at basically what have been um, the patterns, I think, in terms of clinical trial disruptions uh, in oncology. And the data is actually quite interesting. Um, what it suggests is, is during that critical phase, about 2% of, of all oncology clinical trials were impacted um, by, by COVID. Um, some of those were just sort of impacted, suspended, um, and some of those has been permanently discontinued. And to put that let's say in, in, into context, it's about 300 clinical trials is sort of the estimate at this stage. Um, and so that's, you know, in terms of volume of activity, um, it's almost like the entire volume of clinical trial activity uh, for a major enterprise, something like Roche, which basically has a portfolio of around 300 clinical trials that they're gonna be running at any given time. So that, that gives you a sense of, I think, you know, one, one, one aspect of the magnitude I think what's been encouraging is that 60% of those trials have, have resumed. Um, and so I think that's positive. And generally speaking, I think the, the common refrain is that more than anything, it's really just a case of delays, delays of about four to six months, uh, I think, in the conduct of those trials. I think what that analysis doesn't um, sort of uh, tell you is um, what are the trials that were going to be initiated that weren't initiated? Uh, there were estimates there that basically about 60% of those trials potentially were sort of impacted. Uh, and what it also doesn't tell you is the research activity and how that was impacted. Um, I think Cancer Research UK had some very interesting data. And I think when you look at charities that raise a lot of money and, and, and basically put that money into cancer research, I think they've been particularly impacted. And Cancer Research UK is a good example. I think they said that in about, they estimate that they, they put in about 400 million every year. And around 150 million, I think, is a reduction that they're sort of anticipating. So I think if you put that all in context, I think what it says is that there's definitively an impact 
um, it's not catastrophic, um, but definitely I think there's an impact. Um, and, and I think what's been interesting though, for sure, is the adaptations. And I think a lot of the adaptations that, that have been made, both on the provider side, the side side, and I think on the company side, uh, are arguably gonna be sort of here to stay. Um, and you know, they range from, you know, what can you do in terms of remote site initiation, remote visits, remote monitoring, ensuring that you get investigational product direct to patients, uh, administration of, of, of investigational medication outside of uh, the actual center. Uh, and a lot of these things are moving. And so I genuinely believe that while there has been an impact, it's been an important learning and arguably an important pivot point uh, for the way that we actually do clinical research. Um, and I think that not only will that potentially make things more efficient in the future based on the learnings, uh, but certainly I think it buffers against um, a similar sort of impact um, if COVID comes back as a second wave. Thank you, Alice. Yeah, just a, a couple things to add to that. Um, on the on the last point, I think it it will potentially because of sort of trials at home, which I hope will continue. It could increase the number of patients who get access to trials, um, and therefore, you know, make hopefully enrolling trials in the future um, easier. There were, I think, um, just. Anecdotally, I think depending on what was being studied in a clinical trial, some studies were impacted more than others. I think some of the CAR-T studies in particular probably were impacted because of the type of care that's needed for those patients in the short term, as well as the amount of immunosuppression um, that's being given to those patients and concern around, uh, around that. And I think some of that is starting to get back on. So I think it, it was probably a little bit uneven as well, similar to what Lori was saying, that even in just regular care, physicians were changing how they might treat patients. I think you got the same sort of thing, depending on what clinical trials they might want to put patients into. Yeah, Tony? Yeah, so I can just tell you sort of our, pers uh, our company's experience. We were running four CAR-T uh, trial when the COVID hit. And, uh, you know, sound our side, we're temporary on hold or uh, prohibit site visits. So we, we actually had to really quickly adapt to sort of the situation, shifting enrollment from the site that's uh, open, and also uh, learn how to do site activation remotely, also how to teach people how to infuse these cells and manage these cells remotely. So I think some of the good came out of these adaptations that make us actually much more efficient. And, and uh, at the end, we, we actually look at our timeline. It didn't slow us down despite all the challenges, but it, it really teach us a lesson that, um, you know, how to uh, overcome these uh, hurdles. I, I think this will, like at least saying, um, you know, eventually uh, bring benefit uh, to bring clinical trial to more people. Uh, and um, and, and uh, broaden the, the, the reach of clinical trials. Thank you, Tony. Uh, everybody is uh, thinking that uh, as a result of this pandemic that there is going to be a new normal. Uh, do you think that, uh, Lori, uh, the way that uh, you take care of all of the cancer patients at Dana-Farber and other places are going to change? Is there for example, significant amount of uh, online consulting or uh, what has been talked about earlier, the role of uh, personalized medicine, precision medicine going to play an important role in caring for patients? Well, I think if there's any silver lining to the pandemic, it is the lessons we've learned from COVID-19. And amongst those is that uh, telemedicine can be very helpful. Uh, Dana-Farber, was doing about 10 to 15 telemedicine visits a week before the pandemic started. And we talked about, oh, we should really increase these. But when the pandemic came within two weeks, we were up to 3,000 telemedicine visits a week for our patients. Now, you know, people who have cancer need to be seen in person when they initially present. The first time a new patient comes, that patient needs to be seen in-house because we assemble a family around that person. It's not just the medical oncologist, it's the radiation oncologist, the nutritionist, the nurses, the physician assistants, the, the surgical oncologist. And we, we like to surround each patient in this, in, in a time that is so fearful for them and they're so anxious with a team of people 
who are their new family. But when you're coming back for return visits, many times that can be done very well virtually. And we have found actually in our experience that our patients are very happy with telemedicine um, for follow-up visits. It saves them time and travel. And we're able to assemble that team, that family virtually as well as we could um, in person. So my guess is that telemedicine is gonna be with us for a long time. It needs to be reimbursed at the same rates that an in-house visit will be reimbursed. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult for providers to basically to afford this because telemedicine is, is, is a uh, financially losing proposition. We lose money on telemedicine. So I just wanna put in a plug for, for all providers and for all payers that we do need to be reimbursed at, at an adequate level in order to keep on doing this, but it is good for our patients. I think the second thing is that we've learned, the second lesson is that, you know, a lot of people can work remotely. We have 5,000 employees at Dana-Farber, 3,000 of them are working remotely. Um, obviously our healthcare workers are, are, are in, but, but financial uh, administrative tasks can be done remotely. And I would guess that of those 3,000 people now working remotely, probably about 1,500 will remain working remotely because it helps in a work-life balance if you don't have to spend time getting to work and leaving work. So this could be very good um, for our workforce as well. And I think it's also cost saving. We don't need as much space. We don't need um, people riding the T, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we've learned some really important lessons. And if I could just say one further thing, I want, just wanted to follow up on Philip's um, comment about repurposing drugs, um, uh, cancer drugs. And a good example of that is a brutinib which as you know, is used for lymphoma for thousands and thousands of people. It's safe, it's FDA approved. And one of our faculty members at Dana-Farber saw that the molecular pathways that activate COVID-19 <clears throat> are similar to the pathways that are activated or inhibited by ibrutinib. And so doing a clinical trial at Dana-Farber, which looks very promising that in patients who are on ventilators or are in threat of being on ventilators, um, you can really help prevent that by treating them with brutinib, which is pretty exciting. Thank you, Lori. Alice, do you think that uh, this uh, pandemic is going to have an impact on drug development and uh, are there going to be a new strategies and approaches? Um, well, um, you know, I, what, one thing I hope is that there is... Um, in the general public, they start to more understand the importance of clinical trials and potentially enrolling in cl clinical trials. And as I said before, more you can make a clinical trial where it can be done remotely and you don't need patients to be in the clinic, the more access you have to patients who live 50 or more miles away from the nearest clinical trial. So I am hopeful that it will have an impact in that way. And I think as has been discussed, you know, on other panels, I certainly hope there is a greater understanding of the need for investment in R&D. And I'll, I'll give a pitch, it was, you know, for antibiotic research for resistant antibiotics and, and other things. I have an ID background originally, so um, something near and dear to my heart, because I really think it is something that we will be dealing with in the future. And unless we invest in it now, we won't be ready for it. And, and it impacts cancer patients in particular, because when you get resistance or organisms, you tend to see them earliest in patients who are immunocompromised. Bill, uh, do you have a comment? Yeah, there, there's one thing I, I uh, wanted to, um, you know, that's essentially um, sort of a plea to uh, the clinical research community because uh, today we have um, a very large proportion of uh, cancer patients being exposed to um, uh, COVID uh, or uh, to the coronavirus and with, you know, a positive test, it should be possible in a real world setting to understand, you know, which of the patients on what medicines fare worse, which are, you know, actually, you know, having a lighter, uh, because I don't think it necessarily goes 
that every uh, patient on, um, you know, cytostatic therapy or more personalized cancer medicines would actually have a worse outcome. It might be that the cytokine storms we see in conjunction with COVID-19 are actually, um, you know, uh, flattened. Uh, and to some extent, there could be some benefits there to the case just heard, we just heard about in Brutinib. Uh, there might be some of the kinase inhibitors we put patients on that are actually also antivirals. And since there are now thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, patients who've, you know, been tested positive, uh, there should be sufficient data material to really understand if um, we can, you know, get some insights from simply just mining the databases. Hey, Han. Well, I, I would agree, and I, I would say to maybe just add to Phil's point is I do think that the community has come together in order to to create, I think, the registries, and I think we've started to see some really interesting and informative data start to come from it, and, and absolutely, I think it'll be interesting to see what else we can glean from it. Um, and I would just echo what Laurie said. I think this has been a huge experiment. You know, we were all forced by the same pressure at the same time to completely, you know, jump into the future, you know, a future that we have all been discussing and pontificating about, but always resisting because we didn't think it was quite possible to operate in that environment. And all of a sudden, we've had to do it. You know, for us, we've had to jump into that relationship with physicians, with patients, and you've had to do the same. I think what's what's helped is that it's just been this giant two-sided experiment and everybody's had to adapt at the same time. So I believe 100% um, that we are completely now in a realm of new opportunity. Um, and I think, you know, it definitely has the prospect of um, improving, I think, patient care. And I would also argue back to Elise's point uh, that from a company perspective, I think we see tremendous opportunities, I think, to support, um, I think, access to medicines uh, through the commercial side now in a far more efficient way. And I honestly genuinely believe that that could lead to significantly improved investment in R&D across the board. And I think that's the challenge that we have to give ourselves 100%. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, as we pointed out at the beginning of this uh, conversation, that the last 15 years has seen a tremendous revolution uh, in the both the types and the number of uh, cancer drugs and therapies that have become uh, available. And these include targeted therapies, immunotherapies, uh, cell-based therapies. So uh, what is the perception of all of you in terms of uh, where you know, this drug development is uh, going and what are the directions that uh, are taking it? Maybe we'll start with Tony. Sure. I think certainly, um, you know, oncology has progressed uh, quite a bit. It's very exciting nowadays, but uh, I just want to point out, you know, editing technology like CRISPR help us program cells to gain super ability beyond normal TN, TNK cells. For example, we can program these cells, make them resistant to uh, exhaustion, tumor microenvironment, even make them to modulate uh, tumor microenvironment and endogenous immune response. So um, I think we're just starting to learn how to build these super ability onto these cells. And, uh, but you know, even just a short period of time, we will learn quite a bit from them. CRISPR really allow us to rapidly prototyping uh, these cells and make multiple versions of these cells quickly. The, the knowledge we gain from these cells in the clinic then can be feedback and refine our design. So I think in the future, we will be operating more like a technology company, rapidly prototyping these cells and learning from them until we achieve cure uh, in patients. This really, uh, I think, uh, as a group transform, you know, CRISPR, for example, is not a tool company, but a knowledge-driven company in that uh, you know, knowledge gain will allow us to know what bells and whistles we need to built into the cell for particular tumor type and particular uh, patients. And, and really the, the aim is eventually gain the cure uh, stage. Thank you. Uh, Lori, uh, you know, much of the cancer drug development and therapeutic development really stems from uh, basic research. And are there uh, trends uh, at your institution or around the world uh, uh, about what are the directions in which uh, cancer therapy is going and uh, who, wh what do you think are the prospects uh, for uh, uh, developing real cures for cancer? 
Well, let me say first that this truly, the last two decades have been revolutionary for cancer, but we really can't be complacent because while the mortality rate from cancer has declined over the last 25 years, uh, the incidence of cancer is increasing and alarmingly so in young people. Uh, an example would be colorectal cancer. I, I, I've seen so many patients come into Dana-Farber who are in their 30s and 40s and who have metastatic colorectal cancer. So we have a long ways to go. Some key priorities, I think, one of them is an immunotherapy because right now there's only five immunotherapy drugs that are being marketed and they help about 20 to 25% of all of our patients and only about 10 or 11 tumors. So we have a long ways to go for immunotherapy. We need to attack the innate immune system as well as the adaptive immune system. We need to control and reprogram the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment that surrounds that tumor. It's full of immune cells and other cells that are immunosuppressive. We've got to figure out how to make them immunoactive. We also need to detect cancer earlier because we all know that if you get stage one cancer, you can cure it. But the 75% of people who, prevent, who present with metastatic disease, much harder to give them a good outcome. And early detection is a very big priority for Dana-Farber. For example, you know, 10% of cancers are inherited. We should be able to identify those individuals and protect them with frequent screenings. BRCA1 is an example of that. And at Dana-Farber, we are testing all women who have an Ashkenazi Jewish background because one out of 40 of them are gonna be BRCA mutant. And we can prevent breast and ovarian cancer. And now we know that 10 to 15% of patients with pancreatic cancer and with prostate cancer also have uh, DNA repair mutations. So DNA repair, understanding how to harness our knowledge about DNA repair is going to be very important. Epigenetics, this is the future as well. It's, the, it's figuring out how to take a cancer cell and turn it back into a normal cell. And that's just the beginning of this field. We need more epigenetic drugs. And, and there's more, but I, I want to emphasize how important it is to continue to fund basic fundamental science, because without basic science, there is nothing to translate. And I think Bill Kalin from Dana-Farber is a great example of that. He asked a very simple question, how do cells sense oxygen? And over a 20 to 30 year career, he figured out how that happened and now there are drugs that target the pathway that he discovered. And he, uh, just a few months ago, received the Nobel Prize for that work, along with Peter Ratcliffe and Greg Semenza. So we must continue to fund fundamental science. There's so much more to do in cancer. Laurie, thank you. Rehan, what's the industry perspective? Yeah, well, so I think if you, you, know, if you really want to improve survival, then the biggest thing that you have to focus on is the early detection and diagnosis. So I, I agree there. I think if you if you want to drive up cure rates, then you've got to have an immune therapy in the mix. Um, and so from our perspective, you know, we're we're genuinely really excited, obviously, about what's happening, the platform and the opportunity to learn, I think, from the tremendous efforts uh, and successes, I think, in the field of immune therapy. And I fully agree with 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 what Laurie's saying. And so um, you know, what are we most excited about is the prospect of, I think, building on the platform, I think, of PD-1, PD-L1 success um, with some very rational, well thought out uh, combinations, potentially, like addressing the tumor suppressive microenvironment at the same time. Um, and I think the other field, honestly, that I think is, is really exciting, and I think we're going to see so much more from it. Um, and it has the prospect of just being able to combine so well with immune therapy and drive up response rates and cure rates. Uh, is is the field of, of, of ADCs, antibody drug conjugates. Uh, I think just the prospect of being able to deliver, you know, cytotoxic with precision um, and basically, you know, drive up the potential to be able to amp up the immune response. I think we've seen some really good experiments that are basically showing the promise of that. And I do think in the next two to five years, that's going to play a pretty big role. That's great. 
I, I let's see your perspective. Um, maybe I'll just mention a few things with a little bit more detail. Uh, first of all, the, the innate immune system, I agree with Lori, that is definitely, I think, one of the next new hot areas of immunotherapy. And I think there's some emerging data on um, changing the balance between um, immunosuppressive macrophages and um, immunoactive macrophages that's starting to look promising. NK cells are really looking promising, both NK CAR cells, which look like they've got good efficacy and maybe a, um, a better safety profile, as well as the ability to give them allogeneically, and as well as um, NK engagers that look like they activate <clears throat> NK cells and then downstream B and T cells. I think the idea, you know, um, liquid biopsies, I think is going to change um, early detection, but I think it's also going to change cancer care as it becomes easier to monitor the mutations that a patient's cancer might get over time. So you can really, on a per patient basis, decide what the next best therapy for that patient is. I think the next place that needs to open up, and I, I think we're in the early stages, is what the biomarkers are to determine what the best immunotherapy combinations are per patient. We've been talking about that for many years. I don't think we've seen quite enough advancement there, and I'm hoping we'll see that in the near future. Thank you. And uh, we have uh, a question from one of our participants, and I invite uh, Tim Claxon to ask a question of the panel. Tim? Thanks, Karen. Um, I'm not sure whether I can be seen, but it's a pleasure to uh, um, enjoy this, this uh, discussion. Um, my question is really pivoting back to, to the COVID discussion earlier. Um, and in particular, thinking about the challenges about clinical trials, I wonder whether the panel thinks that we could, or, or maybe that we should see um, some elements of regulatory flexibility as um, the current wave of, of clinical trials moves forward. Um, I'm wondering, for example, for highly promising experimental therapies, whether there could be a greater leaning on single patient IND data, at least for accelerated approval. Um, and then for drugs that are already on the market, maybe a greater leaning on real world evidence. Mm -hmm. So what, what does the panel think about opportunities to make lemonade out of lemons? From the I'm going to start with uh, Phil. Phil, uh, Phil, do you want to start? Yeah, and especially the, the last point you bring up, I think there is a chance to actually, um, uh, you know, based on real world evidence to um, qualify that um, certain therapeutics will be effective. And uh, whether you could get an emergency um, sort of uh, approval through that, or whether you um, would uh, uh, still be needed to run uh, an RCT prospectively um, is obviously up for discussion. Uh, but I think we've seen a lot of flexibility among the regulatory agencies in the US as well as in Europe uh, to provide uh, both um, you know, fast approvals of trial protocols as well as um, uh, exempt um, approval uh, for a certain therapy. So, so that's pretty clear. I'm not so sure about, you know, the ability to um, get, uh, I would say, uh, approval or a go forward signal based on just a, a single patient, or I, I, I don't think we are quite there yet. Um, I personally, uh, I don't think we've uh, in Bayer had any experience with that, but I would also be hesitant to move that forward because at the end of the day, it's also the industry's credibility at, at large, which is really um, you know, at stake here. And if we push it too aggressively and we end up with too many, I would say, uh, sort of mudded or murky data uh, without being able to conclude to them. I think we're doing ourselves a disservice. I, I would on, agree. Do you have a perspective? I would absolutely agree with Philip. Um, we do need to be very careful here. We need to make sure that we are administering drugs to patients that are safe for sure and also have clinical efficacy. And I think we've seen what's happened at least in the United States, um, in that regard, we we really we really must listen to 
to people like Tony Fauci, Dr. Fauci, um, and be very careful what we do and not approve drugs that don't have very rigorous and uh, uh, well-defined efficacy and safety. Yeah. I, I actually, I actually think there's a risk for the industry right now that if there is a lack of confidence in the FDA, that could negatively impact us. And so, really, the next few months I think are going to be critical. We've been in that position before, where the FDA got much more strict. We've recently we've seen it in the opposite direction, especially in oncology, and we'd hate to go back. Someone asked about real world data. There is an example of the FDA approving a new indication for a therapy using real world data. I think um, Pfizer's CDK, which was approved for women with breast cancer, I think their indication in men with breast cancer was based on real world data. Yeah, I'll ask maybe just Tony. Tony. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Tony. I would just like to say that as we have seen COVID, it's very important to have strong and uh, validated clinical data. Many of the supposed to be therapy that was initially touted, you know, just, uh, you know, NTIL6, for example, turn out to be negative in the randomized trials. So, so I think we, we had to be a little bit rigorous here. If you approve a drug that turned out to be ineffective, in fact, you're actually blocking the more effective drug from coming because, you know, in oncology, you always say you have to fail this drug after you fail that drug, but you fail a, a drug that's not very good to actually uh, slow down the progress in effect. So, so I do agree. I think the other thing we learned from COVID is that there are ways, you know, sort of um, regulatory agency can sort of uh, demonstrate leadership and flexibility. And certainly I always think oncology, uh, uh, you know, it, it's always a great example where they, they show a lot of flexibility and, and partnership with the industry. I, I think that should be encouraged. Uh, especially after this lesson on COVID, and this will help us progress the drug uh, develop much faster. Tony, thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, the uh, panel for uh, this uh, great discussion about uh, the exciting things that are happening. And it's now time, uh, time for a five minute break. And I want to remind everyone to participate in our online polling. Uh, below this video window, you can scroll down to find the panel. Uh, two questions, uh, and please submit your answers, and uh, we'll, they'll be open for one minute. Thank you very much. <laughs>